Aloha kakoa pau, and welcome to another segment of Voices of Truth, sponsored by the Kiwani Foundation. My name is Kai Opua Fife, and this, uh, today on this segment we have with us Leon Siu. Leon, welcome. Thank Ma you for coming in. Appreciate it very much. Aloha. We had a brief uh, opportunity to uh, to meet at the palace uh, on January 17th with the Living Nation. Uh, events that were going on there, yes. and uh, so I appreciate uh, your being able to come and share with us what, you, what you're doing, uh, who you are. Uh, I know that you're a man of many talents and much experience. Uh, in our segments, we're looking for what our individual uh, interviewees do mm -hmm. and how what they do contributes to the improvement of uh, the society improvement of uh, our sustainability mm -hmm. and so forth and so if you'd give us a little uh, kind of a self-introduction who you okay. are how you got to where you certainly. are today. Certainly. Um, I was born and raised on the Big Island. Um, I, I'm from the, the little fishing village of Milo'li'i in the sou southern end of the Kona side mm -hmm. of the island. Mm -hmm. um, from Milo'li'i my family moved to Na'alehu and then from Na'alehu to Hilo. So I was educated in Hilo. Mm -hmm. um, but we maintained our place in Milo'li'i and in Na'olihu, and so we would go back on the weekends all, all mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. So I consider myself uh, from Milo'li'i. Uh, uh, my grandfather was a canoe builder and a fisherman, uh, so I hung out with him a little bit and learned a little bit, got a little bit of the, uh, of the passion for, the, for canoe building and, sure. and that. So, but I didn't do it very much with it at that time, uh, and then uh, when I came to the university, well, I attended the University of Hawaii in Hilo for two years, and then I came here. Mm -hmm. And my major, it was fine arts, uh, but I also was very interested in music. So around my junior year of the university, I dropped out of uh, the fine arts program, and I just went right into music mm -hmm. and started performing in Waikiki. Mm -hmm. And uh, within a few years, I've been performing not only in Waikiki and Hawaii, but um, on the West Coast and actually across the United States and had quite a career uh, composing and um, producing music and performing mm -hmm. uh, all around the world, Europe, the United States, and South, and South Pacific. Um, and around 1978, we decided to uh, leave the road and, and move back uh, to Hawaii. Our son mm -hmm. was about to be born. And so we decided we wanted our son raised here than rather than on the road. Terrific. And uh, so uh, we moved here back, back mm -hmm. home, although we had all, always you know, gone back and forth. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was during the, the early 70s, while we were very much involved in, in music, that the whole uh, Hawaiian Renaissance started to happen. Mm -hmm. It's the beginning, I, I believe, in the area of music, because the, it, within the music was preserved a lot of the language and a lot of the, the, uh, the thoughts and the, the spirit of, of what, who we are mm -hmm. as a people. And so in, in learning Hawaiian music and in, in producing and singing Hawaiian music, uh, you really started to get more of a feel for who we are. Uh, then this whole renaissance started happening around the Sunday Manoa and uh, other groups like that. And mm -hmm. So we were all quite close at the time, kind of moving forward with this Hawaiian music. Maiki Ayu was uh, reviving the interest in the hula kahiko. Um, and so there was, it was a really wonderful time to be around. Very exciting to Very be around. Exciting. Young. And yeah. at the same time, uh, things started happening politically. The uh, Proteka Olavi Ohana, uh, you know, was being formed by the mid-70s. Um, mm -hmm. Waihole Waikani uh, Community Association and their struggles uh, started to arise around that time. Yeah. So we got involved with all that, with Save Our Surf and all, all kinds of things that were mm -hmm. going on mm -hmm. politically. Um, and that's how I became much more aware that not only are, are we a people culturally, but that we are also a people of, of a, a nationally that we have not only a cultural heritage, but we have a national heritage mm -hmm. as well. So from that point, I got involved with Auntie Pilahi Paki and um, uh, Kawai Puna Prejean, mm -hmm. uh, Liko Martin, Hank Fergustrom, and we used to have these weekly meetings to consider what our options are. This is about the mid-70s. Right. Um, what our options are as a people and how we can politically uh, bring our nation back. So the whole thing started around that time. Mm -hmm. So the composition of um, uh, Hawaii Loa Kulike Kako, right. that, that was all around that same time. Yeah. Um, 1977, there was a big Onipa'a 
uh, celebration at the Iolani Palace. Uh, that was the first of, of many to follow after that. Um, and that was also quite significant, I felt, because it was the first time that uh, we were starting to use the music uh, to rally the nation. Right. Um, and I thought it was quite, quite an impressive time. Yeah, the, the, the founder of the Kwani Foundation, Butch Kekahu, was mm -hmm. also a That's right. musician, entertainer, right. and uh, found that uh, you know, the medium of music yes. was a tremendous way to communicate. Yes. Yeah. And uh, so from that, we started to, uh, over the years, uh, being involved in, in several different levels in the independence movement, um, but also realizing that as a people, we still we needed to not only regain, but uh, practice our identity. Mm -hmm. So it was being done in the area of music, it was being done in the area of, of the, the hula, the dances, and in other areas of arts. But mm -hmm. then wh where were we in the practical areas? It's canoe builders, fishermen, taro farmers, and all that. Mm -hmm. And um, that was an area that I felt that uh, much of the mana was still being preserved in that, that area, but it needed to be passed on. It needed to be come out into the open mm -hmm. and to become uh, something that, uh, that our young people would embrace and would be drawn to. So Hokulea was a significant, significant cultural event and a significant event to the, our identity as a people, mm -hmm. as well as our identity as a, a, a nation, as well as our identity as the Polynesians, you know, among all the others. And hopefully I broke, broke down a lot of barriers and opened up a lot of eyes. Um, so I really credit that particular pro project as the one that had the real breakthrough. Um, well, you know, I, uh when you speak of Hokulea and all the things that were going on mm -hmm. around that time, I know that what transpired as the concept of the canoe, the canoe culture expanded, mm -hmm. that people started to realize how many different tasks and crafts mm -hmm. and arts were required That's right. to complete a canoe. Right. So a voyage was the culmination of an entire community's efforts over exactly. years to right. build up to that point to be able to partake in a voyage. Mm -hmm. So uh, what was significant about the, uh, the experiment of the voyage of rediscovery of Hokulea mm -hmm. was that it proved that uh, Polynesians were not uh, just um, uh, serendipitous kind of uh, sailors or, or you know, none of these happened by accident. It was a deliberate, long, uh, painstaking prepar preparatory period yeah. to go on these voyages and they not only they wouldn't do that just to chance them, you know, just out in the ocean. Mm -hmm. they, had a, they had a way to get there, they knew how to navigate the ocean and all that. So I think it set aside um, a lot of the notions that people had that, that, uh, that this whole thing happened by accident. Yeah. And that, uh, so the deliberateness and the carefulness of the Polynesian societies began to, to surface. And then you start going through the genealogies and all well, this. Well, the pride that must have uh, mm -hmm. uh, be, be, been realized mm -hmm. uh, to, by having to recognize what the accomplishments were of the ancient Hawaiians. Uh, you could uh, look at it similarly of traveling from here to Mars. Right. I mean, really back in, if you put yourself right. back in that time, those right. same kind of voyages. But we did it with great frequency. So in a way, it was almost like driving from here to Honolulu. Mm -hmm. You know, it was mm -hmm. uh, after a lot a while, Not as much traffic, though. Yeah. I mean, it was a little bit more preparation than that. But, yeah. but it was, uh, they, they became, uh, our, our ancestors were very skilled at navigation mm -hmm. and all that. And they traveled uh, at will, um, not only among the islands, but also to North America and South America. Mm -hmm. And anyway, so. Well, this is this, the same time that Europeans were uh, afraid of falling off the edge yeah, of the earth. Clinging yeah, clinging to the shores. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, and I, sometimes in my talks I say that, you know, the Polynesians settled all of the major, all the uh, major islands in the Pacific a thousand years before Christopher Columbus was even born. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, Quite anyway. a statement. Yeah. Um, so that led us to thinking, uh, well, it led me to become more involved in things that were of a practical nature that I felt were, were cultural uh, as well as, um, as, as nation building, something, something that could build mm -hmm. up mm -hmm. our identity. Um, so canoe building was an obvious uh, area because I had been involved with Hokulea 
um, I had actually uh, assisted in the making of the documentary mm -hmm. for the voyage of the Hokulea. While I was uh, in um, traveling all those years, I was quite involved in, um, in the film industry in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. too, particularly in the music area. So I was a music editor, composer, uh, screenwriter, I mean a score writer. And all that. Great so, experience. So I scored the film, uh, mm -hmm. The Voyage of the Hokulea for mm -hmm. National Geographic. Oh, great. Um, anyway, so this, uh, I began to realize that there's more to simply the intellectual understanding of who we are. There has to be a hands-on uh, uh, awareness that's built right. by simply doing mm -hmm. these things. So planting taro, building canoes, building holly and all that mm -hmm. is a, a hands-on connection back to the land and to back to who we are, back to our ancestors. Uh, all, the, all these things I think are, are very important. One of the things that Hokulea, there are some downsides to it. Um, what, the good side, of course, is which we, we already discussed, but the downside was that Hokulea tended to still be a bureaucratic effort. Mm -hmm. It was still uh, pretty much locked into the bureaucracy of modern day, which it had to be in order to raise the funds and do all of these organizational right. things. But once this was proved, then we have to go back and see how did our ancestors do it? You know, were they tied up in bureaucracy and all that? Mm -hmm. And in mm -hmm. most cases, we feel, no, they weren't. They were much more free to act and to be creative. So um, we've been mulling over for some time uh, building a canoe much more in the traditional style, uh, rather than the fiberglass hull that Kokulea has. Mm -hmm. Well, that was for convenience, sure. because it would have taken too long to try to learn how to do a dugout. Mm -hmm. And then later, uh, Hawaii Loa was, uh, became a dugout, and mm -hmm. they, they worked on that. And, um, and then, then you have the project, the um, Makali'i on the Big Island, which was a break from the, the uh, Polynesian Voyage and Society kind of bureaucracy. Right. They basically was a community that mm -hmm. said, we're going to do our own, and mm -hmm. they did it. Which I think is getting back to what you began with, is that building, constructing a canoe and everything that goes with it really is a really involves the entire mm -hmm. community, perhaps in some cases the entire island. Right. Resources and individuals, but right. their, their various skills, right. expertise. Yeah. So around 1996, um, we started really thinking hard toward, so 1995 was the gathering of the canoes that came up from Rawatonga right. and from Aotearoa. Mm -hmm. And um, 1996, we thought we really wanted to do something that was indicative, well, looking at the year 2000, the turning of the millennium. Anticipating Anticipating it. that, we said, now, what would be, have been the, the prime or the, the most, uh, uh, something we could display as an, a great accomplishment and achievement mm -hmm. of our people? Mm -hmm. And the canoe became the obvious thing. So we thought, okay, this is our time to build a traditional style canoe. Mm -hmm. um, we had come back from an indigenous people's gathering in Aotearoa, a Maori friend and I, and uh, we got, after that, we, were, we really felt con confirmed in our hearts that we wanted to build this canoe, 1996. Mm -hmm. uh, it was December of 1996. The traditional way. Yeah. yeah, the traditional way. Right. And we had been building other canoes too, uh, mm -hmm. some smaller ones. But we wanted to b build one that was a lot big enough for voyaging. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, <laughs> we came back and we thought, okay, well, it's a good time to start now. We felt it was time to start and we checked our, our uh, organizations, a bank account, we had $11. Mm -hmm. Cash bank money, but Yeah, on so hand. I said, okay, we're ready to start. Well, mm -hmm. the very next weekend, we find this log lying on the beach. Uh, somebody told us it was a log on Waikani Beach, mm -hmm. and had been lying there for three or four years. Uh, it's a great red cedar log. I actually have a picture of it here. Um, this is the log, it's oh, about three feet in diameter. Mm -hmm. It's buried halfway in the sand here but about three feet in diameter, 36 feet long. And uh, we looked at the log and we said, well, this isn't big enough for a 60-foot canoe. But then our ancestors would have said, it's a start. Sure. You know? yeah. and, uh, and that's what you had. Yeah, right. And one of the things a lot of Hawaiians and didn't, re didn't realize was that the, the ancient canoes were all pieced together because they needed to build large canoes, and mm -hmm. they, they often didn't have large enough logs. Mm -hmm. So they pieced them together, and they devised ways to sew them together, to fit them together, to join logs. And this is incredibly ingenious when you think of, of how they did these. 
So we thought, well, let's start. So we did. We decided that would be the center part of the keel. Mm -hmm. And uh, by faith, we started proceeded, proceeded from, the from keel, that. Huh? We had one piece, and we dragged it up on the beach at Waiholi over here. Mm -hmm. And then um, we, used, we decided we could, this is going to be the center. We need a log for the, for the bow and for the stern. And then to build it up, we used the planks from the original. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we did. We got, uh, this is a monkey pod log that came from a tree that fell in Heia. Some friends called us and said, come and get it. Mm -hmm. you, you can use it. So we used that. And we use it for the, for the, this is the stern. And then the bow has another piece like it. Um, we joined these three logs together. And it came out to just shy of 60 feet. Mm. By the way, we never use a measuring tape on this. We, no. People ask us how long it is, and we say, this long. All the way <laughs> to the end. From right? here to there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and uh, then we started putting the ribs in and planking up the sides. And everything lashed. Everything is glued and lashed. Lashed. Yeah, and glued pegged. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So there's, there are no metal parts in it. Mm -hmm no metal pieces. And then as I'll show you what the lashings look like on the inside. Oh, there's some here on the outside. Yes, there are lashings on the outside mm -hmm. here where you see there's three uh, pieces come together mm -hmm. right there. The, the joint, by the way, to join the logs was uh, something that we um, had read about and had heard about. It's in some ancient chants and all that. It's called mm -hmm. a haumi joint. Mm -hmm. And it's actually named after the woman who solved the problem of how to join logs together. I'll be darned. Yeah, so it's named after her. How I've seen some uh, oh, Mediterranean, Mediterranean time uh, style vessels that incorporate this uh, right. similar type of right. uh, construction. Yeah. So this is the, the lashings on the inside and the ribs. Oh, and fantastic. Now, there are seven ribs in here, and there are uh, 17 seats for paddling stations. And the, each one is named, and each one is named for a particular part of our history, uh, mm -hmm. or a navigational star, or, or a land that was uh, our myth mythical land, not a mythical, but something from our, our lore. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, anyway, there are names throughout this, and names from all over Polynesia. Well, now you mentioned 17 mm -hmm. paddling seats. Yes. So this was a... a a paddle-driven canoe, or did it also yes. have a... Well, yes, it, it's a paddle-driven canoe at this stage. Uh, but this is, again, that's another thing about our ancestors, that, is that their canoes evolved. They developed them, and, they, and they, they, they would tear them down smaller if they needed it smaller, or they'd build them up again bigger if they needed mm. to go. they put another hull on it, and they go sailing. Then they'd dismantle it. They'd use one hull go one way, another mm -hmm. hull go the mm -hmm. other way. Mm -hmm. And so you find these legends um, that are very famous of, like, I think the Tainui canoe in, in New Zealand uh, shows up at two different places at the same time. But it's the same canoe. Yeah. But it means that they separated the hulls, and one went one way, and the other went the other way. Amazing. And um, so, uh, so at this stage, it was built for paddling. And, and the first time we took it out, we launched it in September of 2000, in the year 2000. Oh. Um, and uh, we had uh, the initial crew was about 14 paddlers, and we launched it from the beach at Waiholi and paddled it to um, Kualoa, which is, of course, the ancient navigational training grounds. Right. Um, and the reason we chose this area, of course, besides the logs just simply landing there, <laughs> um, these drift logs, uh, we chose that area because of the, the that it's very steeped into in our culture as well as uh, in our history. Mm -hmm. So why Kane is a very important place. Uh, Kualoa was the training place of navigators. Mm -hmm. uh, why Hole, why Kane area was the training great, uh, grounds for the kahuna mm -hmm. of that area. When you first, first put the, uh, the hull in the water, how did it sit? Did oh. anyone anticipate how it would We how prayed it would a lot, in the water? Yeah. and it sat beautifully. It sat exactly where we thought it would. Terrific. Yeah. And so we paddled it from uh, over. I d forgot to bring the pictures of the actual ceremony. We went to. Um, Mm -hmm. and we were greeted by uh, uh, six high schools, um, their voyaging programs. Mm -hmm. And they, they, had, they, were, they camped out there for that weekend for this event. Mm -hmm. And then we had a, a formal welcoming uh, and the protocols and all that with the, mm -hmm. with that, uh, with the high school students. So there have literally been hundreds of people who participated in this hands-on, one by one, you know, no big organizational thing. You know. But a community effort. A community effort, and uh, worldwide, the mm -hmm. people, 
would be driving by along the highway. They would stop and they would look at this, particularly the Native Americans. They would stop and say, they'd look at the wood and say, what kind of wood is that? And yeah. we say, western red cedar. Mm -hmm. And they go, that's our wood. Right. You know, yeah. that, that's their tapu wood, their, mm -hmm. their kapu mm -hmm. wood that they use for making their great canoes as well as for their totems. Yeah. So the wood has a lot of spirit in it. And there were two red cedar logs that drifted in. The first one which we found on the beach and another one came drifted in seven months later. Mm -hmm. So the project has been underway for seven years now. And uh, we, after that initial voyage um, and the, the inauguration and the launching of it, then we uh, shifted and we converted it into a sailing canoe. So it's got a, it has a big ama on it and it, it has a, it's a rig for sailing. Uh, these, this is a car, the carving at the end of it. Called, in, mm -hmm. in New Zealand, it's called a taura. Right. Yeah. And uh, let me see if I can find a picture of the rig for sailing. No, I guess right here. I think I saw one earlier. Yes, about, see one. Yeah, what, a Latin sail? Was it a, yes, a exactly, sail? a Latin sail. Right. Yeah. Anyway, it's somewhere in this book. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Where it was. Uh, you know, there were some Solomon Island uh, yeah. designs that utilized the mm -hmm. Latin sail. And mm -hmm. then more right recently, the, yeah, there it is. And there were some, uh, some studies done on the efficiency, and it's a really oh, an yes. efficient uh, sail uh, and design. And amazingly, it's, it's uh, not only efficient, but it's not as cumbersome to use. Mm -hmm. We had originally thought we'd, we'd need a crew of, of uh, 12 just to wrestle the sail around and mm -hmm. to, to be able to work that. But uh, one day, three of us took it out, and we were able to... 60-footer. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, it's just shy of 60 feet, I think. Did you have many young people involved in the process? Yes, uh -huh. like I said, those six uh, high schools with their uh, navigation uh, mm -hmm. program uh, called, uh, oh, I can't remember what it's called now. But anyway, um, we have quite a few young people involved. In the construction? In the construction, some mm -hmm. hands-on things, and also in the sailing of it. Mm -hmm. uh, we taught them a few sailing things, and they go sailing with us. Um, but more than... Uh, the fact that there are young people involved, but we had people, old people, young people, I mean, just this incredible Multi-generational. Yeah. And multi-racial, you know. Um, there were Germans involved in this, there were uh, Italians and uh, Africans, uh, all drawn to the fact that this was a handcrafted mm -hmm. uh, vessel from a, another time, you know, and yet it's being built today. I'm looking at these uh, lashings. Mm -hmm. And I know I had spoken with some canoe builders from South Pacific who, I, I forgot what the number was, but they told me how many different types of uh, kaula or cordage mm -hmm. that they needed for different locations, different twists, different yes. tightness and so forth. Some had to be flexible, right. and some really strong. And that in itself that, is a major... That vaka, ta, uh, vaka taumaka. taumaka yeah. yeah. Um, those are uh, yeah, for Micronesia. Yeah. Or Solomon Solomon's. Solomon's, yeah. Ones, yeah. And th that's an incredible canoe because the, the thing about the canoe is that it has to be flexible. Right. And so if you look at it, you think this thing will never go because mm -hmm. everything kind of moves. Right. You know? and, and yet, there they go. They go that's a design mile. function. Right. Yeah. It's part of it. And yeah. as they go, if they say something's a little too loose, then they go and tighten it up. Yeah. And, and that's basically how our ancestors were. Mm -hmm. They kind of went with it. And they, 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 there wasn't anything that said everything had to be absolutely this way right. or that way, because in different conditions, you have to be able to adjust. Yeah, the real basic meaning of nalu, huh? yeah. flexibility, That's right. uh, making it work, you can, you can understand the uh, sea conditions varying mm -hmm. would require different, mm -hmm. uh, very interesting. And, and the significance of this is, is, is one, is that it is uh, reviving a uh, depth of the culture. Um, I mean, it, it continues to, to dig mm -hmm. deeper into mm -hmm. who we are. Mm -hmm. uh, but what it does also is it says that that there are people contributing to this whole identity of who we are as well as to the nation building and all that from mm -hmm. whatever level or whatever area they're working in. Mm -hmm. So a canoe builder contributes just as much as a statesman, you know, and, uh, and a tarot uh, farmer contributes 
just as much as, as uh, a politician. You know? Well, every function was critical to the success of the, uh, right, of the, of the society, the community. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Mm -hmm. uh, this has been all very interesting. Uh, before we close, uh, we'd like to uh, see if you can answer a question that someone sitting out in TV land may, okay. may ask as to uh, uh, how can they get involved in something, maybe not exactly this, mm -hmm. uh, this concept, but how can they get involved and should they get involved? Um, that's a good question, and I think, yes, they sh if they feel led to, they should. Mm -hmm. um, that, and that's how people became involved with this canoe. They simply were driving by, they'd stop, they'd say, what are you doing? And mm -hmm. we'd explain, and, um, and some people would stay, and they'd yeah. stay for weeks and yeah. months, you know, or And some years. would uh, drive away. And some away. Would, would help out a little bit right. and drive away and say, thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. But there, everybody contributed to it. Everyone's a part of it. And everyone who adds to it, you know, adds to the mana of the, the entire mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. So the canoe sitting there right now in, in uh, Waiholi Bay is actually not just a canoe that was built. It's, mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the culmination and the, the uh, collective work and the mana of all the people who contributed to it. Of a community. It, as well as our ancestors who brought us up to this point. Terrific. Yeah. Uh, Leon, mahalo again for being with us. You're welcome. Uh, we'd like to thank you folks for tuning in. Uh, remind you that you're watching uh, Voices of Truth, sponsored by the Kiwani Foundation. Please look for our next segment. Uh, we chose that area because of the, the that it's very steeped into in our culture. So why Kane is a very important place. Uh, Kualoa was the training place of navigators. Why mm Hole, -hmm. uh, why Kane area was the training grounds for the Kahuna. Mm -hmm. So. There have literally been hundreds of people who participated in this, hands-on, one by one, you know, no big organizational mm -hmm. thing. You know. But a community effort. A community true. effort, and at the, worldwide, the mm -hmm. people would be driving by along the highway, they would stop and they would look at this, particularly the Native Americans, they would mm -hmm. stop and say, they'd look at the wood, and say, what kind of wood is that? Yeah. And you say, western red cedar. Mm -hmm. And they go, that's our wood. Right. You know, yeah. that, that's their tapu wood, their, mm -hmm. their kapu mm -hmm. wood that they use for making their great canoes as well as for their totems. Yeah. So the wood has a lot of spirit in it.